Hello, my name is Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng, and together we are the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces intersectional and intergenerational film and artwork from underrepresented communities. We're also founding members of the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op, which is an artist-run worker cooperative whose goal is to provide flexible living wage income to artists. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Part of our work as labor activists and queer artists on unceded territories means working in solidarity with ongoing indigenous struggles for sovereignty, de decolonization, reparations, and land back. Hapa Talks emerged during the pandemic from our collaboration with the Lim Association in Chinatown, historically a neighborhood of Chinese railroad laborers who were brought to settle indigenous territories as part of the ongoing colonial project. So why Hot Pot Talks? As Jen mentioned, uh, Value Co-op has a studio in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Association building in Chinatown. Um, and when we moved into that studio, we were had long conversations about the role that artists have played in gentrifying the neighborhood. And we're really intentional about building reciprocal relationships with, with the neighborhood and to the broader community as well. Um, Value Co-op has a no surpluses, no kickbacks model, um, where all of our surpluses are redirected into community, community projects that serve the community or to employ artists um, and so over the past two years we've been collaborating with the Lim Association on a project to digitize their archives and create a series of artworks that invites people to learn and engage uh, with their positionality to to Chinatown and Chinatowns as, as a theme with the increased conversations about anti-Asian racism recently the past two years have brought to the surface already existing yellow peril narratives re-emerging again during the pandemic we've seen Chinatowns and elders targeted by racial violence and vandalism We've seen the rise of Boba Liberal organizing around hashtag Stop Asian Hate demands for hate crime legislation, which is pro-police, pro-surveillance, and harms Black and Indigenous communities. We've seen gentrification eating away at the souls of Chinatowns and other BIPOC communities, seemingly with no end in sight. This season, we'll touch on themes of diaspora, xenophobia, systemic racism, intersectional solidarity, building, and Chinatown futurities. Um, before we introduce our guests today, um, I want to thank our incredible team, Ava and Cameron, behind the scenes who help make Hapa Talks a reality. Um, I'm so excited to introduce our guest. Rita Wong is a poet scholar who attends to the relationships between water justice, ecology, and decolonization. She has co-edited an anthology with Dorothy Christian entitled Downstream, Reimagining Water, based on a gathering that brought together elders, artists, scientists, writers, scholars, students, and activists around the urgent need to care for the waters that give us life. An associate professor in critical and cultural studies at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, Wong uh, has also served her faculty association as a steward and president. Rita works to support indigenous communities' efforts towards justice and health for water, having witnessed such work at the Peace River, the Wedzen Kwa Ada Is Ferry Creek, the Columbia River, the Fraser River, the Salish Sea, and the Arctic Ocean watershed. She understands that when these waterways are healthy, life, including people, will be healthy too, and that we cannot afford to endanger and pollute the waters that sustain our lives. Welcome, Rita. Hi, Rita. Hello. Thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> Maybe Rita, we, you're you're on sabbatical right now. Um, maybe we'll start with how how has the sabbatical been? What have you been up to? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, 
in theory, I'm working on a book of essays around waterways um, that I've visited and spent time with and tried to protect. Uh, but I have to say I've been very busy with the union work this uh, semester, and it hasn't been much of a sabbatical, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, that said, I did manage to get up to uh, the Unistoten Healing Center for a couple of weeks in the snow um, back in February mm. and was able to uh, spend some time up there. Um, uh, in the bio, Jen, you mentioned the Wetsin Kwa. That's a river that is so clean you can drink right out of it. You wow. don't need to chlorinate it or treat it or anything. And uh, I just felt so grateful to live uh, even briefly in a place where you can still do that. That's what the Wutsu wow. people have been protecting mm -hmm. uh, for many, many, many generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so rare. I'm, this is immediately making me think my partner and I are kind of preparing, slowly preparing over time, um, gathering emergency supplies and materials. And one of our, what, the one thing that's on our wish list is um, those wands that you can place in water to filter out the water so that they're drinkable. Oh. Um, and, you know, because it's just, we, we, it's just unheard of for like clean drinking water and we're kind of doomsday, you know, preparing for the, for our unforeseeable future. It's so good to prepare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm what, I'm wondering, you know, maybe we can just, because this, this going into this topic, I wonder if we can just like kind of dive right in because, you know, Jen, this thinking about doomsday, mm -hmm. I mean, um, we, we just noticed this, this, the hail and this very like, tumultuous <laughs> yep. weather that we've been having. Thunder. I'm wondering, you know, because one of the things that I've been thinking about is like, you know, uh, you know, and last year I'm thinking about, you know, the, the heat dome, right? And then yeah. everyone's panicking about buying air conditioners, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking about preparing for emergency supplies. And so, I, and one of the things I've been trying to undo in my brain is also just preparing for the like emergency, which I also need to do, Jen. Thank you for the reminder. But also, what is what are the pieces that um, need to be sort of undone in my life that are contributing to the, these these crises as yeah. well? I'm wondering because I guess I mean I don't know if I have a full question about this, but like Rita, when I was when just in this couple minutes of hearing this initial conversation about, I mean, reading your bio and thinking about you know, when we have healthy waterways, we have healthy mm -hmm. life too. Mm -hmm. How I'm, how did you come around to, 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 to rec not just recognizing, but also like enacting that in your activism, recognizing that there's actually, you know, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it there. <laughs> that, that's a great question, David. Um, and I think it, maybe it comes from the sense of being proactive rather than reactive. Like mm -hmm. the emergencies hit and we're in it already, but there's still a lot that can be done to prevent it from getting worse. Yeah. And so, um, you know, um, I had spent time, for example, last summer up at Ferry Creek where folks have been trying to protect old growth forests. And those trees, like, they're so enormous. They're like, um, you know, the size of this apartment room that I'm in. And they create their own weather. They create rain. Yeah. You know, they're wow. so, they're a force of nature, basically. And it is an act of stupidity and uh, I think it's criminal negligence mm -hmm. to be yeah. cutting down these ecosystems that we really, really need intact, not just locally, but globally. Mm. Um, and I came to this journey in a sort of circuitous way because I, you know, I grew up in Calgary on Treaty 7 territory, um, homelands of the Sutina, Siksika and Stony First Nations, quite disconnected from that history. Like I didn't know back then that my family and I were drinking from the Bow River basically uh it wasn't until i was in my 20s that i kind of like oh okay that's where our water comes from and mm, that's where mm. our wastewater goes and and you start to see yourself as part of this hydrological cycle that mm. uh you're actually in you're not separate from it and um i have a, a lot of friends to thank for that journey uh, dorothy christian who i co-edited um that downstream anthology i i mentioned um she, uh, many years ago with her friend uh, Denise, organized an event called Protect Our Sacred Waters. And the vision of that gathering was to bring together people from all four directions for the sake of water. Mm -hmm. That now is the time to work together um, or it's going to be very, very bad for all of us. Mm -hmm. so, so learning to cooperate and come together and to know what gifts we carry and how mm -hmm. to share them is, I think, how I started on this. And then 
uh, Dorothy and I, uh, at, at that time, Dorothy made that call, and I was actually in Florida teaching at the University of Miami for a little while, and I wasn't able to attend, but I decided to take up her invitation in a really long-term way, like I developed a course around contemplating water, I applied for a fellowship and, and spent some time developing that course, and and since then, it's just been this journey of like paying attention, showing up where the water is, and just listening. Mm-hmm. A lot of listening and trying to share what you learn. Mm. Rita, I'm so curious, and, and this is just like I, I just, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation and that I can actually like talk to you in person. Um, because when you know, I w- when I was in my 20s, becoming more involved in activism in the community, I've only ever heard of. It was so rare for me to hear um, like Asian names and in activism and so you know the 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 the, the few that i heard you know you being one of them rita wong lai wan and and um uh, larissa lai it was so rare for me to see kind of people that look like me um that share kind of a, a racial or ethnicity background um involved in in such a kind of visible way so i'm i'm curious about you know what your observations has been over the, the decades of, of organizing um, in terms of what, what was it like organizing when you were younger versus your observations of how people organize now? Yeah, well, growing up in Calgary, I didn't move to Vancouver um, until uh, the mid-90s, but I, I felt very much that sense of um, kind of a hunger to, to see other Asian faces involved in these things too, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And um, when we were growing up in Calgary, Hiromi Goto, uh, myself, um, Suzanne Dehi, and some other folks, we were part of a Women of Color collective. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, in Calgary, you have to understand that this is quite different than in Vancouver. Like you, I mean, this is also in the 90s, so I guess, you know, it's a few decades ago. Oh, my God, that sounds really old. Um, and, and um, you know, we were similarly looking around. And for us, yeah. we were looking at, like, Sky Lee, for instance, her novel Disappearing Moon Cafe. Um, mm-hmm. Jam Ismail, who's an amazing poet that more people should be aware of. Um, um Lily Shinde, for instance, like yes. uh, there's a, a, a generation and many generations before us, but you like, I feel like every generation we have to kind of look, go out and look for them <laughs> and try to find them, right? And track them mm-hmm. down and spend time with them. Um, mm. And so uh, we were lucky uh, that Lee Miracle came and did a mm. workshop with us in Calgary. This is like the early mid 90s. And Lee basically, uh, I think that one workshop, it was just like one day workshop, but it really put me on the path that I'm on today. Um, Hmm. Lee was so generous and she just had this way of being really kind of forthright. She's like, you know, you're living through war (laughs) and, you know, there's sort of this polite pretense in Canadian society that you're not, but colonization, Mm -hmm. you know, for, for Lee's family and for many indigenous families, the apocalypse has been happening already. Right. Yeah. It's been going on for generations and generations. Um, And, you know, I think, what Lee taught me, and there's so many things, but she shared with us like a history of solidarity of relationships that had existed between Asian and Indigenous peoples, for instance, that wasn't mm. documented, wasn't told, but the, the, there was a mutual kind of aid that had happened, uh, you know, that um, still is important today, I would say. Mm. And I, I, um, I also, when I was in Calgary, um, my first book of poetry was called Monkey Puzzle, and my editor mm. for that was Claire Harris. Claire's a African Canadian poet who's now passed, uh, sadly. But Claire actually warned me. She said, "Don't let them call you an activist because then they'll just dismiss you, or mm. you have to do all the work and they don't." You know, and I, it was good advice, but I couldn't really take it. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I, I, I kind of always felt like, well, whatever people call you, they call you. You know, like we have to find ways to find each other somehow. Um, yeah. But like I, I did take her warning to heart in the sense that what we do is mm-hmm. basically like practical stuff and everybody should be doing it. Yes. You know? mm. um, yes. So just, I guess, maybe to think about it as, as a way of picking up um, the work that needs doing, whatever mm-hmm. that happens to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I see so many different kind of s- synonyms um, or like euphemisms around that, that, that is around the word activist, right? There's organizer, convener, mm-hmm. uh, facilitator, 
um, yeah, there's just all these different words, you know, that you can take on. But I've always found a kind of power in, in naming and, and, and embodying. It is yeah. activism. We are and activists. It- it's interesting because you know we ha- had this conversation I think last week at because I'm 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 also doing I'm doing a PhD right now and there's an emphasis in the pro- well there's been a conversations and sort of the that have been emerging about the fact that you know we we were a- obviously academics and there's now this new emphasis in my program to you know around art but what about the activism <laughs> and I'm curious it's interesting because that seems to it seems to be um, different institutions that kind of want to push that down. And they, no, 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 focus on like the intellectual, quote unquote, the intellectual stuff or the artistic stuff and don't sort of stir the pot with your weird Marxist <laughs> activism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's good to reclaim it, but I, I think, you know, like all all terms have their sort of limits, I guess. It's, it's how yeah. they get deployed and how they get received. <laughs> that yeah. maybe is the question. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. does get co-opted as well. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I always am very careful depending on the context. Um, and, and when I hear other people, and especially in spaces where, and we can talk about this later in terms of um, the corporatization of spaces, but I do see, you know, different corporations using the language, um, like our language, if I can say that, um, as as like a weapon, you know, and they weaponize it and then they, yeah, it just is. Yeah, it's so upsetting. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's a good, you know, this has come up in a couple episodes where, you know, do we do we counter the, the co-optation or do we find new language? Because I, I often hmm. get frustrated that like, how do we, you know, we're always being put on this, like needing to find new, redefine something because the police have now claimed, are now trying to take transformative justice, you know, that type of language. The cor- corporations are, are taking climate justice language, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. Or Rita, they're taking, you, yeah. they're, they're doing the equity, diversity and inclusion, the EDI, yeah. right? It's oh, now yeah. totally corporate. Yeah, yeah, it's so corporatized. It's yeah. really upsetting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't get me yeah. started on that. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. Like, I feel like like when they use that language, you have to try to hold them accountable to it. But it's such a Herculean task, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, uh yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so frustrating. Um, well, like, I don't know. I mean, even terms like queer, right? Those were people taking those terms back Mm. and I think there's value in holding on to um the terms that have served you right and and honoring those words Mm. so I don't know I I think it depends on the context too Mm -hmm. um Mm. but yeah um but I wanted to circle back for a second before I forget um Mm. and it was that um Lee Miracle had organized a gathering of uh Asian and Indigenous writers when uh she was visiting um writer at uh i think it was western washington university in bellingham that's how dorothy and i met and and got uh, oh. to meet each other and work um in a very long way you know over many uh years now and like just the uh attending to making spaces for us to gather and to like not be under the white gaze and to just mm. be able to speak frankly and to take the time to build relations and get to know each other like that is so important you know mm. Mm. um so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that i and we passed last year and mm-hmm. i know she's missed yeah. by many many of us yes but yeah i just when i think about all the generosity that she had um because we had every reason to be angry and i think we do too um, mm-hmm. And anger can be powerful, as you know, Audre Lorde and others have written, but it can also have its limits. And so to try to work from a place of love, like, you know, as you obviously know, with love intersections, I think mm-hmm. that that is really important, like, um, to, you know, of the range of places that we could be coming from, to come from that place is really important. And, mm-hmm. and we did that very, very well, I would say. Mm-hmm. Even though people counter confrontational, I, I just thought she was always just very frank and to the point. Oh, totally, and yeah, so yeah. badass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering because um, it's becoming, and I'm speaking with ex- from experience, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to organize, um, and I think that, you know, for a large part of it is due to the pandemic having changed the entire landscape of, of how we organize in person, mm-hmm. because now it's, 
we have to navigate the hybridity of virtual and you know in person so i'm i'm wondering what your projection or what your um, observation or insight is in terms of how 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 groups can organize um, and, 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 and I'm saying this because I'm, I'm, you know, David and I have to prepare and, and different plan B's in terms of how we organize like a symposium, whether that's navigating, okay, there's a possibility for cancellation or just having to have all of these different backup plans in order to, um, cause, it, and sometimes people just don't even show up. So that's been something we've been, um, we've had challenges around. I don't know, David. Did you want to add more to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. it's it's something that that is something that I think about too. Like, you know, obviously when we had to, um, and I hate the word pivot, but <laughs> when we had to pivot, uh, you know, the so Hot Pot Talks was originally it grew out of a cancellation of the exhibit that we were supposed to do with the Lim Association, and so we wanted to, you know, how do we continue these conversations about colonialism? Uh, Chinatowns, um, you know, um, intersectionality and, and those things, um, you know, continue them in a way that we, you know, with with folks, out, you know, even though we can't do this exhibit. Um, but I'm also thinking, you know, Jen, despite like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about all of the movements that have also been galvanized over the past two years, mm -hmm. like really, really like, you know, I'm thinking about the Black Lives Matter um, mm -hmm. movement, you know, um, land back to, an, you know, mm -hmm. to an extent as well, really, really and I'm thinking about all the like the the statues toppling, and you know there's mm -hmm. debates around the you know the just the the symbolism of that and not the actual what's um, material changes as well. But I'm also just thinking like you know so much has also happened just in spite of being isolated. It's and true. I know I I don't know if I'm sort of steering away from because you're talking specifically about organizing digital on versus the ground. in person. Well, and all, but oh, there's some, know, on the ground. Mm -hmm. But there's something there, you know, like there the there's there's been a. Um, yeah, there's been a big energy as well in 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 spite of the mm -hmm. the, the, the probably separation. because we were all home and paying attention to what's going and on. And pissed globally. off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, that's these are such good questions that I don't know that I have a great answer, but I I would say that um, there was something Lee wrote in one of her stories, Goodbye Snoke, which is find freedom in the, um, find freedom, sorry, find freedom in the uh, context you inherit hmm. and that we're built for transformation. Hmm. Um, and I would say that it has been very tiring, you know, hmm. uh, kind of living with the anxiety and the instability of COVID. Um, at the same time, I think that, you know, it presents a real call to um, organize on a massive scale uh, mm -hmm. in terms of um, both climate uh, crisis, but also in terms of, um, I guess, mutual care. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, you know, one of the things that I think I found in the pandemic was that I'm a fairly introverted person and I can handle a lot of isolation just fine. I actually don't um, <laughs> suffer for that very much. But what yeah, I same. have trouble with is, um, you know, uh, the sense of time shifting and the scale kind of getting all wonky, I, I guess, a little bit. And so... Mm like so it feels things are dispersed like so you didn't have your exhibition but now you're having these prolonged conversations over many years <laughs> yeah you know and many it's years. less legible <laughs> it's less legible in one way yeah. but more legible in another way right depending on how you're yeah. looking at it yeah um and so i don't know like i think the good thing is that there's a record for us to go back to and and kind of build on but at the same time, uh, it makes us easily surveyed and tracked, too, because yes. everything's yeah. online. Yes. So, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, I, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. But that said, there's still a lot you can and have been doing, I think, with these conversations. I did watch a few of them and really enjoyed them, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, the logistical challenges that you were raising, like... I don't know, there's not much, you know, 
to do with that except to maybe learn to be compassionate with each other mm-hmm. around it. Like yesterday I was biking around to stop by something to pick up some soup from a, a business where one of my former students works and it was closed because of illness, you know, and like mm-hmm. there's more and more of that kind of stuff. And that yeah. seems unusual in a Canadian context, but it's not unusual in other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Mm -hmm. I lived in China for a year teaching English in the early 90s. And, you know, stuff is not always predictable and you Mm -hmm. you just kind of learn to roll with it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it it creates like, I think, a different sense of time. Like there's something about colonized time that's like everything's got to be really precise, really reliable, like German trains or Japanese trains, (laughs) that kind of thing. Right. (laughs) And then there's like the rest of us are like, you know, whenever we show up is the right time. Yes. Whoever shows yeah. up are the right people, you yes. know? Yeah. So yeah. I, I think it means like just kind of loosening up a little bit in terms of our own timelines and our mm-hmm. own rubrics and our own mm. expectations of ourselves maybe. Yeah, yeah I do appreciate. I, I, I lurk a lot on different forums and um, pay attention to what, you know, people are, you know, reading and saying on the ground. And one of the observations that I've noticed is that we've become more increasingly, um, the conversations are becoming more increasingly about anti-work and not having a five day, 40 hour kind of work week and what that actually means. And I think the pandemic really kind of put the spotlight on that because we were all of a sudden able to work from home um, when so many, you know, disability activists have been, you know, talking about this and making things virtual, making things accessible for, for, for so long. And then all of a sudden when able people and able bodies are experiencing this, you know, hardship, that that's when all these accessible um, tools became available to us. So, yeah. I, I feel very mixed about it because I, on mm-hmm. the one hand, appreciate the digital um, access, but on the other hand, I still feel very suspicious of technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't help it. It's yes, it's not, it's not uncommon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have such gripes with it as well in terms of, um, you know, which corporations I have to shell out money for. And they, yeah. they make older, you know, models obsolete because it forces us to buy newer models and newer adapters. Yeah. Um, that to me is just is 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 a terrible, terrible thing. Sorry, David, you're going to say something. No, I was just I wanted to ask because we were talking about time um, and mm. think, yeah, and. Um, I know, Rita, you mentioned you haven't been an archivist for a while, but you, we, we've been talking about sort of, um, you, you were referencing um, like memory as well and thinking about mm-hmm. um, ge- re- referencing generations that have come prior. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how that has played into your work? Or you've, you've mentioned sort of the, you know, your, your work with Lee Maracle, but I'm just thinking, I, I don't know much about when, what, what the archiving work that you were doing um, Sure. Yeah, and how it plays into your, yeah. your, your work. Yeah, um, so I um, did my undergrad in English literature at the University of Calgary uh, years ago. And then I went and uh, taught in Japan for a year, came back here, did a master's degree at the University of Alberta, and then mm. went overseas and taught uh, in China for a year and then came back here. And when I was living in Calgary, I decided to apply to... Um, study the uh, to become an archivist so that's what actually brought me to Vancouver initially was the archival studies program at UBC and I also was really interested in connecting with the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop in Vancouver like Mm -hmm. because I was in Calgary which is at that time very white and I was really Mm -hmm. curious about what was going on in Vancouver and really hungry for a sense of Asian community right and writing and creative community in particular and um, so I did uh, learn uh, how to become a professional archivist. I, I did like write a organizational profile of success many, many years ago as an <laughs> assignment for one of my classes. Uh, also the Chinese Canadian Library Society, also um, all the Umista Cultural Center up in Alert Bay. So I did various projects uh, just because I was interested in community memory. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I was also at the same time uh, eventually working at the Delta Museum and Archives as an archivist. And then we went on strike for four months and were locked out. Um, And that experience was pretty formative for me in the sense that I came back into a workplace that was very toxic. And I I basically said, you know, I still care about these things, but I need to move on. So Mm -hmm. 
So mm. I applied for a scholarship and I was lucky that I got one and I ended up going to do uh, doctoral studies at SFU, uh, focusing on Asian Canadian cultural production. Um, and uh, my supervisor was Roy Miki. And Roy was a great supervisor. He was like, just do what you want to do. Like, you know, and I was coming at it as an adult. So I had a lot of, uh, I think, support to study whatever I wanted to study. And I spent much mm -hmm. of my doctoral studies actually organizing with a group called DARE, Direct Action Against Refugee mm -hmm. Exploitation, uh, mm -hmm. that was um, formed partly through a lot of relationships that had already built through the queer Asian community. So there was a group called Monsoon of Asian bisexual mm -hmm. and lesbian women that was active uh, at the time or, or just before DARE formed. And so when four ships of migrant people from China arrived on these shores, we already kind of knew each other and we had networks that we could just organize, right? And, mm. and so we had meetings, we had surprising turnout of people, uh, a lot of support. And so we started going into the prisons to visit the women. Uh, we were sort of ad hoc translators at one point because the yeah. prison system mm. was not set up for any of this. Um, and we, out of 600 people on four ships, there were about 90 or so women. Uh, and at that time, the prison in Burnaby was still open, the Burnaby Correctional Center for Women. So mm. we'd go in there on a weekly basis if women had um, refugee hearings and things like that, we would accompany them or observe or try to support them. If they actually got out of jail, we would try mm -hmm. to connect them to housing and and just like very sort of basic kind of support needs. But we weren't just sort of there to be a, a social service agency because we were all doing this off the side of our desk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So volunteer ad hoc, you know, because nobody knew this was happening and yeah. we weren't prepared for any of it, but we just had to respond. And mm. so we also did um, a report basically looking at uh, making recommendations about how you shouldn't criminalize uh, migrants and undocumented people, not just Asians, but uh, lots of people from yeah. different parts of the world, of course. Yeah. And, um, you know, tried to advocate for a less classist, less exclusionary um, immigration system. And unfortunately, uh, things, I think, got worse, not better. But we we did uh, try to bring a systemic lens to it mm. and a lens informed by how um, many of the people that were displaced were partly in relationship to um, Western narratives of progress being imposed overseas. You know, so, mm -hmm. for example, there was a woman who was displaced because um, the farm that she had lived in, you know, was being plowed under for uh, uh, an airport, mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? And so this, so, so it's this model of Western so-called development is yeah. right. basically driving us to the brink of mass extinction. Yes. Like, mm. it's not a sustainable model. Mm. Um, and it's displacing, you know, millions of people. So, so that was, I think, um, how I got into it in Vancouver, you know, just mm. through different um, networks and, and people kind of responding to things as they happened. Because when the folks arrived on these shores, the racism in the newspapers was yeah. kind of horrific. It was yeah. like, go home and, you know, like, just really inhumane, not thinking about what would it what would drive people to get on a boat yes like get on this really dangerous voyage and like you know risk their lives to come here there was none very little uh corporate media uh that right. was you know even vaguely um sympathetic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 this this topic of archiving and Jen and I have been actually just over the past few weeks been thinking about that because and this came up for me because in my um because it, it, honestly, during my comprehensive exams, <laughs> you know, my supervisory committee was like, where, where are you placing your work in the genealogy of other, you oh. know, BIPOC artists who, who have been doing anti-racist work? And as I've been talking to folks in like, you know, the quote unquote previous generation that have been also been doing this type of work, like David Garneau and Zul Solomon and mm -hmm. Richard Fung, who's on my committee, Dana Claxon, they keep bringing up, for example, like Min Minchon Panchayat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and I was like, and when I read um, other conundrums, I was like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> the, these battles, like that were or these fights have been happening forever. Ever, <laughs> that's right. They have. 
And yeah. so I think about like, anyways, it just it has been on the back of my mind because, you know, the what what we're organizing against right now, um, trying to think of a way that that becomes archived so that yeah. and making sure that we sort of sh keep sharing that mm -hmm. so that that that, that th those um, yeah, those uh, those archives continue, you know, are, are, are kept somewhere. Yeah, like when I first started, I forgot to say this earlier, um, I was really like I first met Larissa at a conference for writers of color that was held um, by the Writers Union in Ontario. It's a cultural thing. It was called. Oh, sorry, not it's a cultural thing. The appropriate voice. There have been so many conferences. Uh. Um, <laughs> it's a cultural thing did happen, but it was in Calgary. And that's where I met uh, Kage and Laiwan, actually. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, my goodness, people from Vancouver. It was yeah. very exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so like I actually like did a lot of work looking for other Asian Canadian writers, like of any, anything, right? Like, and you go into the archives and you look for it. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a book called Chinese Women of America. It's a photo book uh, by mm -hmm. Judy Young. And there was a story in that book that really kind of resonated for me. And it was um, a woman named so-called China Annie. Like they didn't actually ever use their real Chinese names in the, like if you even got a newspaper clipping, which was rare, but if you even got that, right, you'd get China Mary or China Annie or China whatever, right? You right. didn't actually get their real names. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. to learn them. Um, but there was this comment that she uh, ran away and stole herself, like that she stole <laughs> her life back. And um, that always stuck with me, the sense of having to steal your life back from all the forces that would take it away from you. Yes. Mm -hmm. So oh, I, I like a lot of that in the history, if you look for yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Rita, I want to ask about your, your poetry. <laughs> um, can you tell me, tell me a little bit about your practice? I think I read, I read an article um, about you somewhere that talked about sort of your, how your activism and, um, practice is in intertwined and many of your books, we started this conversation talking about water, um, uh, our, the theme is very. It, the theme is of water is is throughout your poetry. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious. I mean, this is also you know, Jen and I are not um, poets or or writers by any <laughs> means, but I'm I'm curious about how your how um, your activism and arts practice, um, uh, yeah, come together. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I, th I think about the poetry is kind of leading me to what needs doing. Hmm. So in my first book of poetry, Monkey Puzzle, um, there's a section in it that comes from time I spent living in China. And when I was in China teaching English, I also did a trip uh, along the Yangtze River. And I was opposed hmm. to the Three Gorges Dam, which had not been completed yet at that point. Um, and I find wow. myself kind of coming full circle now opposing the Sight Sea Dam in BC yes. for similar reasons, like the displacement of people, of land, the destruction of like incredible cultural history, you know, all these things that are being devalued for the sake of um, a profit, basically, that isn't actually sustainable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so it, it was kind of like the poetry led me to what needed doing like once you say mm. something you kind of have to live by what you said <laughs> um, so like posing the dam for instance like I came back and I was like talking to I think it was Ming Pao or you know like just kind of uh trying to live by where the words had led you mm. um and you know I think poetry is important for me as a lifeline as a way of um trying to articulate what needs to be done um, but it's not the same as doing it right mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be in conjunction with people with communities with economics with you know social issues etc mm -hmm. and so people will often say oh your your poetry is a form of activism and it is but it isn't you know mm -hmm. yeah like it, it is in this realm but not in this other realm and yeah. you know I was on a retreat for burnt out activists many years ago and there's a sense uh, that you know, there's sort of three things that need to happen. One is, um, you know, uh, a sense of protecting the gains that previous generations have made, that kind of reactive work. I see the union work as, as, as kind of like that in that realm, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. that work is important, like housekeeping, but it's not going to be enough by itself and it can really burn you out. 
Yes. Um, you also need a systemic analysis of how the system's working and where there, you can put pressure points and change things. And then you actually need to build the things that you want or, you know, mm. make them come into place. And so I think of the creative work more in that third realm, although it can mm. operate in other realms too. Mm. And, and so, yeah, just to try to figure out where to put your energy can be a, a tough call sometimes yeah yeah that's interesting because i think in may, jen and i have had this conversation too in some of the stuff that we've been trying to to explore too like we won't might we might not really know how to articulate it in our in our work yet but like in our art practice making a, a film about it like i'm thinking jen about yellow peril queer mm -hmm. destiny for example there was so much about like and it's funny we were, so we're, we're we're filming a sequel to it um or not a sequel, a follow-up. And at the time, you know, um, in 2018, when we conceived it and we shot it and released it in 2019, we were thinking about a queer Asian futures and not sort of fully sort of Understanding out. what that means even at the time. And then now fast forward after this. Figure it out as you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we figured it out as we go. And then once we sort of made the film and then now it's kind of taken on a new life in a way, just because of the racial politics of pandemic pandemic times so it's mm -hmm. kind of this kind of like yeah it's interesting the yeah that i am I'm, I'm what i'm resonating with is this sort of mm -hmm. like what comes first is not necessarily so linear in terms of activism mm -hmm. and practice mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah um rita I, I wanted to ask you just before we leave this point you you talked about um you touched on labor organizing um and i'm wondering if you you said you said um uh, something around the lines of um, the reactive part as being really important in terms, of, or I think reactive organizing as being important and labor being a part of that work. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Sure. Um, in Okay, so let me step back a little bit and say I, unions are really important and I'm glad we have them and we need more of them. But I have actually at the fundamental level a sort of unease or an ambivalence about the um, paradigm. And because when I was trained as a steward, you know, to listen to people's uh, complaints, to file grievances, to try to get, you know, remedies for situations, I was also taught at that point that, like, there's a pie, kind of, and your collective agreement when you negotiate one as a union is, like, takes a slice out of that pie. But the rest of the pie belongs to the manager or the employer, the boss, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually messed up. Like, and I really appreciate mm -hmm. that you guys are doing a co-op because I think that's the right model. The pie belongs to everybody, not just the boss. <laughs> and so yeah. you guys are sort of in this, um, you know, we're here to um, rein the boss in. But at what point do the workers ever actually take over the means of production is is kind of the, the question, right? Right, For me. right. Um, there's some really good documentary called The Take. I think that Naomi Klein, oh, yes. and they, they, you know, workers are totally capable of taking yes. over the factory and just like doing the work, you know. Um, so yeah. I think I and historically universities were actually co-ops. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's the University of um, Bologna was a co-op for many, many, mm. many years. So mm. like the university model as it is like this idea of collegial governance, it actually like if it's formulated in a way where the faculty and the students are the members of the co-op, it works a lot better than a corporation, which is unfortunately yes. the pressure that we're seeing today. Like everything's kind of top down, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. corporatized. And that's actually a really culturally dysfunctional model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm really feeling that in my school <laughs> life. Oh, but it's also, I hear you. Yeah. It's also, you know, that's why exactly why we were we're also, we're a unionized co-op too. So we also have a collective agreement, and also we're mm -hmm. all the, and also I mean I will just maybe just quickly mention. I mean what we've been also been trying to um, think through as well is because even the co-op model, there's there's faults in it too in terms of the fact that like. Um, there's we have a board right um, and so we've been and you know we haven't figured out the perfect model for it yet but we've mm -hmm. transferred all of the decision making to the general assembly mm -hmm. which means a lot more meetings <laughs> but, it all, but it also yeah. means a lot you know that the decisions are always are not made by a, um, a you know a, a circle that is 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 confidential for example and not accountable to the the rest of the membership as well mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but thank That's you good. I would yeah I've been yeah. thinking about that a lot yeah 
Yeah, no, I, that's exactly it. Like, how do you make your decisions and how do people have some say in what's happening? That's, mm -hmm. that's basically kind of what it comes down to. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, good point that, yes, absolutely, co-ops should be unionized too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one thing that I, I mean, one thing that we're, we're experiencing too is that people are still coming into whether it's like a union space or co-op space they're coming in or a collective even um they're coming into it still playing the role that of of of, of an employee for example yeah. um and it's it's and even for myself it's been very difficult to kind of like recalibrate and like reshift my mind in terms of who am I answering to or do I step into embodying the, the actual power that I hold as a worker versus just doing what an employee is supposed to do and answering to an employer. So we've been having kind of issues around how do we facilitate that um, a healthier model for people to actually step into that 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 role healthily. Because um, on the and the other thing, too, you know, I would add to that, too, is like we are trying to flatten hierarchies and redistribute like be really like as you know really interrogate power yeah, and hierarchy we can say that but Under, we step into hierarchies constantly and yeah. I, like for me as if as when i facilitate that is is so visible and so 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 apparent um that you you put a group together and and people naturally step into those complex hierarchies um which isn't always you know necessarily a bad thing you know um, Rita, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, you, well, you, we're, we're, oh, oh, yeah, go sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was just going to say this idea that we're all equal, like we're all equal in value, but we're not equal yeah. in power. That's, yeah. that's all. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to, I wanted to make sure that we save some time to talk about all the, um, all the organizing you've been doing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us sort of maybe some of the, yeah, some of the, what, what, what are you up to in terms of organizing and maybe how can people get involved too? Sure. Yeah. Um, I feel like I, it's not just me. Like when I, when we say organizing, I think there's a whole bunch of people. So as you may recall, I, um, Back in 2018, uh, there was a big rally of about 10,000 people up on Burnaby Mountain. There was uh, a Coastalish Watch House uh, built on the east side of the Trans Mountain Tank Farm. And uh, there was also a camp called Camp Cloud at the entrance of the tank farm. And there was a lot of activity. There have been waves and waves of activities over the years. So in 2014, there was a, um, a wave of arrests. In 2018, another wave of arrests. Um, and like at different times, people have uh, organized and risen up uh, spontaneously, I would say, in response to the pipeline uh, expansion. And so the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, the Tsleil-Waututh Sacred Trust uh, has done a, a comprehensive environmental assessment that shows that we cannot afford the risks that this pipeline would uh, do or, or inflict. Mm -hmm. and. You know, the Tsleil-Waututh, just to put it into context, um, and and Lee is actually a granddaughter of uh, Chief Dan George uh, from the mm. Tsleil-Waututh Nation. And there are, you know, lots of familial relation, relations throughout this area. But um, the Tsleil-Waututh have been doing a lot of work to heal the land. They're a small nation, about five or 600 people, down up from about 13 at their smallest number, like right from the brink of extinction basically and they've been gradually mm -hmm. healing and building themselves back up and they have um you know uh done work to clean the water so that they can harvest clams again uh they have done oh. work around uh, restoring salmon habitat and wetlands they've mm -hmm. been reintroducing elk into the territory they're doing amazing work to heal themselves and the land and all mm -hmm. of this is endangered by this horrific pipeline expansion mm -hmm. like even if there's no spill which i think is unlikely because spills have happened throughout yeah. um the history of this pipeline but even if there was no spill simply extracting three times the amount of bitumen from northern alberta in the tar sands and burning it is basically going to cook the planet so we mm -hmm. can't afford it, right? So I can bike, yeah. I can recycle, whatever. It doesn't really matter what I do individually because that scale is so small. Yeah. Like we're right. living in an area that has a huge mass scale project that is like so 
obviously me by myself, I can't do much, but there are hundreds of people and maybe thousands of people that are really worried and concerned about this. And so one of the things that COVID made difficult was that sense of gathering, for instance. Mm -hmm. But the Watch House is still there. It's, um, there was just a rally uh, this past weekend that brought in Indigenous leaders from across North America. Um, and there's a renewed commitment, I would say, to stopping the pipeline. Um, the, um, there's an organizing happening at Burnaby Mountain. I'm not one of the main organizers, but I'm so happy to support other people organizing. Uh, it's called Hug the Mountain, and mm. folks will be basically hugging Burnaby Mountain and making a point that we have to care for the land. Um, mm. And the Kosilish Watch House that I've been up supporting for the last uh, four years since it was built runs under the law of Natsamat. Natsamat roughly translated means one heart, one mind, one spirit, that we're all related, um, that we're connected. And watch houses were traditionally built to uh, guard against the enemy, to watch for the enemy, which is Trans Mountain in this case, yes. but also mm -hmm. to look after our loved ones. And it's been really hard the last couple of years watching the amount of trees that have been cut down, like thousands of trees that were there when we were up there in 2018 have been basically clear cut and taken out and they're expanding the number of tanks from 13 to 28. Um, mm. So mm. all of the foliage that used to be habitat for birds, like I've seen yeah. flicker feathers, uh, red tail hawks, eagles. I've even seen a bobcat up there once a long time ago. Um, you know, there was wow. a bear that hung around the mountain. All, all of that is just being decimated, basically. Mm. It's, it's turning into this barren wasteland. And so I think this is where maybe art also has a place to play because, you know, so we have these tanks, how could we repurpose them? What else could you put in a bunch of tanks besides bitumen and toxic mm. shit? Like maybe you could turn it into an anaerobic digester and take food waste and turn it into energy. You know, like mm -hmm. there's other right. things that could be done with those tanks basically. Mm. And I am not the technical person to tell you what that would be, but mm -hmm. I, I am the person to say, we need to imagine better and we need to imagine differently. And it's urgent that we do so. Mm. Um, so folks continue to um, uh, rally, as I mentioned, uh, to basically uh, try to stop work. There's an injunction that, pre that um, involves people um, if you're arrested, as, as I was, um, uh, you can face up to, you know, a month of jail time for just basically blocking uh, a truck for like, I don't know, half an hour or something it, like the mm. and then at the same time last year, there were uh, nesting hummingbirds uh, around the Brunette River watershed where they were trying to cut down trees. And those little hummingbirds stopped the logging for about four months. So people who are because oh. of environmental laws that um, have to protect nesting birds. Yeah. But then after the nesting happened, then or they, they came in and cut it down. So those birds don't have a place to go this year. Mm. Right. And so wow. um, people have been up in trees. People have been just basically blocking trucks. There was an 80 year old woman, Catherine Hembling, who spent her 80th birthday in jail for blocking a Trans Mountain clear cutting. Like all of this is still going on. It's not being covered by the corporate media, I would mm -hmm. say anywhere near how it should be. Um, mm. But there's a sense that through a combination of divestment, there's also been attempts to divest from um, uh, the, to tell the, uh, um, insurance uh, insurers of uh, the pipeline to divest and to not insure this pipeline, uh, you know, and people in insurance, I think, should understand and do understand the real, um, they're not just risks now, they're yeah. probabilities and probably certainties at this point that mm -hmm. more climate instability is coming. So. Yeah. I remember being at a fundraiser once where David Suzuki was like, we're like that coyote that's chasing the roadrunner and we've fallen yeah. off the cliff. Like the roadrunner is able to stop, but the coyote can't because it's too big and dumb and it just keeps falling off the cliff. But yeah. how far we fall off the cliff, whether it's two inches or two miles or 200,000 meters, that still matters, right? Yeah. So right. like stopping the pipeline, stopping these really destructive projects, stopping clear cut of old growth, all of that is like, really important to do um yeah so uh if folks want to get involved they can check out stoptmx.ca 
Um, those are some of the folks who've been basically uh, up in the trees uh, and not everybody, I'm not athletic, I won't be up in the tree, but <laughs> I um, do, there is a need to support folks who are willing and able to do that work. So, you know, I, I helped uh, facilitate an art exhibit in the trees last year, yeah. for instance, and oh, cool. um, wow. brought food and, you know, stuff like that. So there's ways in which we all can do different things to contribute. So like whether it's divestment, not ensuring civil disobedience, um, you know, reiterating again and again that it's indigenous law that we need to be abiding by. And indigenous law has not given consent. Indigenous mm -hmm. law involves a responsibility to protect these lands and waters, which mm -hmm. the federal government is failing to do. Um, so whether we're talking about just reiterating the importance of decolonizing and um, upholding indigenous laws mm. um, and also just, uh, you know, stopping the work. Um, I feel, oh, and the third thing is uh, nature itself. Like the floods mm. stopped yeah. the pipeline construction for many weeks last year or actually mm. maybe it was this year in January, whenever it was. Yeah. And, you know, so I feel like the economy is sort of always being framed as if it's the most important thing, but actually it's not the most powerful actor on this planet. No, That's the earth is. itself. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so the more mm. we connected, we can stay to nature. Uh, the more we work with nature, like whether it's paying attention to little hummingbirds or floods or fires or heat waves and amplifying the messages that the land is already telling us loud and clear, you know? Um, so I, I feel like, we're basically aligned with the earth and mm. that we have to remind people to align themselves with the earth and to basically right. resist this kind of colonial um, uh, Pressure? dysfunction. Dysfunction. Yeah. 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 It, it's, I think of it as a form of insanity, like this disconnection. Yeah. Well yeah. 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 And on that note, um, that's yeah. just a perfect way of ending. We um, want to end with our favorite question that is the most consistent throughout each episode of Hot Pot Talks, <laughs> which is, uh, Rita, what is your favorite hot pot ingredient or oh, experience? Um, before I answer that question, can I say one more thing? Yes, <laughs> yes please. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it was, it's just that when we care about the lands where we live and the watersheds, mm -hmm. we also have to care about the ones that are far away. So um, mm -hmm. I've also spent time up in the north around the Sight Sea Dam. Mm -hmm. And I'm connected to that watershed just through the very, very electricity that's bringing us together. About a mm -hmm. third of the energy we use in BC is from the previous dams on the Peace River. And so my hope is that we don't repeat the violence of the past and that we find mm. a way to stop that from happening again. Mm. Um, and there's a really important court case with the Blueberry River First Nations up in the Northeast in the Peace region that people should be aware of because it says that uh, cumulative effects have been too much and we've basically, BC has breached its treaty responsibilities. Um. So, so the they basically Blueberry now is, is in a position where if anything else happens on their land, they have the right to say no to it mm -hmm. right. and have it backed up by the province. So wow. I, it's I think a game changer. It's it's very early days yet, but wow. I would keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of my favorite uh, ingredient, I would say the broth. It's got to be the water, right? Yeah. It's got to be the water. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. And no one said that. No one's ever said the broth. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favorite broth? Oh, I love it at the end, you know, because yeah. all, mm -hmm. the all the flavors built Absorbed in, in more. There. Yes. yes. Yeah. So yes. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Rita. It was so nice to have you on Hoppa Talks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Love right. talking with you. Great. Well, thanks. Thank you, Rita. And um, we'll see you at the next episode. <laughs>